You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is The Art Ambassador with your host, Gwenda Joyce. A former gallery owner, Gwenda takes artists through a step-by-step process that moves them past frustration and into comfort, abundance, and creative flow. So now, please welcome the host of The Art Ambassador, Gwenda Joyce. Hello, and welcome to The Art Ambassador radio show. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce. We're coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Radio is such a great communication medium, and I'm here to help bring art into the conversation. On this radio show, we talk about art, artists, and the changing world of art in all its various forms. Whether you're an artist, an art lover, a collector, an art world profession, professional, or in any way just love to be involved with art, we're glad you're here. The art world is an exciting place and is constantly changing. It's made up of a constantly evolving roster of new artists emerging onto the scene and artists who have been on the scene for 40 or 50 years and more. Last year's art world sensation was a 102-year-old woman named Carmen Herrera from New York, and she was heralded for having her first one-person show in a major gallery in New York City. You can get discovered at any time, right? Other artists are always making news. For example, Robert Rauschenberg, one of the most significant artists of the last 50 years, is being featured in a major retrospective now at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. It just opened and will be on exhibit through January, giving us a chance to see his work in an historical perspective. When you see the show, you'll notice how much his art and his way of seeing things has influenced what has gone on in the visual world. In the world of contemporary art, new artists like Carmen Herrera are receiving attention and notoriety all the time. That's what makes contemporary art so relevant and fun. Artists respond to the world around them, and they're interpreting it in unique and personal ways. Back in the 19th century, when the salons held power over social taste, there were stiff restrictions in terms of what was acceptable to make art about and what wasn't. I just caught a show at the, D- at the Legion of Honor with a lot of Rodans in it, and I was reminded of how these restrictions held play over the way people could make art. Subjects had to be held... Subjects had to be acceptable to the academy, and they were limited to still life, to landscape, to historical events and mythology and religious stories. That's why when the Impressionist painters came along, they were so outrageous. They broke down those conventions and painted paintings of everyday life. It was shocking. Nowadays, pretty much everything goes. There's a lot that is shocking and a lot that isn't. You can determine what you like based on your own inclinations and your interests and what you like and what you respond to. Artists, too, are free to challenge and question any and all existing conventions. They're challenging customs with their images, with their subjects, and their materials. Materials have changed in the 21st century. They're constantly being reinvented. The same is true with collectors and buyers. Collectors can collect anything and everything. There's more openness in terms of what's acceptable than ever before. 
These attitudes make the art world more democratic, but it's also harder because there are so many options and everyone's taste comes into play. The situation has become such that arts institutions, such as museums, define an aesthetic for themselves based on their own curatorial direction and the community that they serve. Each one is different. I took a trip across the country several years ago visiting galleries and museums, and I was really impressed with how different each region was in terms of the visual aesthetic that they presented in their museums and their art centers and in their galleries. When it comes to art galleries, galleries also tend to define their aesthetic based on what appeals to the gallery owners. Gallery owners are really unique and individual. Their galleries are a result of a very personal and often controversial or groundbreaking uh, aesthetic that they want to present, or it can be more traditional. And it's always shaped by their location, depending on what the clients respond to. Galleries have been known to band together in districts, and that allows more people to come to visit a number of galleries at once and choose the ones that they like. Rather than having the kind of art that they choose to show or how that they find how to find the right artists, the biggest challenge for galleries these days has to do with location. Location causes a significant challenge and sometimes a problem because there isn't a lot of available space that is also affordable. Today, as my guests, I have with us two gallery owners on the show who are going to tell us about how they are handling this changing problem. Rents have been rising all over the country, and in every community, the rents have been moving galleries and artists out of their comfortable spaces. Artists have had to find new spaces for their studios, and as a result, they've had to move out of the city. This has happened in San Francisco, which has grown as a tech center. Uh, Buildings that housed artists and galleries have been pushed out and forcing a real problem for the galleries and artists that want to continue in business. This tenuous situation was met by a very creative solution by two San Franciscans, Deborah and Andy Rappaport. They have a great story, and it's really exciting to tell what they did. The Rabbit Pours are entrepreneurs and longtime art collectors, mostly collecting art that brings social awareness and crosses many media. They've enjoyed a long cultural exchange and engaged with the art that has brought them into the current situation, and they wanted to do something to meet the challenging situation head on. So that what they did is they envisioned and created an entirely new facility that offers affordable and economically sustainable spaces for galleries, artists, and related nonprofits. They found three founded three warehouse buildings in the Dog Patch area, which is an industrial part of the south side of San Francisco, and they began a large-scale renovation to house their vision of a new kind of arts community. The complex is called the Minnesota Street Project, and it retains and strengthens San Francisco's contemporary art community by providing public art excavation spaces. In doing this, they have created a main building that has 11 permanent and independent gallery spaces and one temporary space available for rent on a short-term revolving basis. These spaces are open to the public. One of the gallery spaces houses a nonprofit educational organization that supports arts in San Francisco schools. The galleries are on two floors surrounding a big open atrium that is a shared space for openings and special events. The building has a special program manager to coordinate for activities. And they also have some public bleacher seating for people who want to just hang out and linger there. They're making free Wi-Fi available, and they're really making it a people-friendly place. Galleries can share resources such as security, um, an online presence, 
and other forms of doing PR. And the whole thing has fostered a really nice uh, sense of community. In Building 2, there is a separate building that's not open to the public, and that's housing an artist studio program for 35 independent artists. The third building houses a climate-controlled store art storage space. So the Minnesota Street Project was completed and opened last year, and it's become a phenomenon. And I'm really pleased to have two of those gallery owners here on our show today, Nancy Toomey and Monique Deshane. When we come back, I'm going to have you find out their story with a face-to-face conversation. We're coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce. Stay with us and find more about this exciting change in San Francisco's arts community. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Hello, and welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show, coming to you live from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and today we're talking about the fantastic Minnesota Street Project that has was established in San Francisco and opened just, just under a year and a half ago. Uh, when the, the project opened, there were lines around the block, and people had to wait to get in due to the limitations of fire codes. I think since that wonderful opening night, it hasn't slowed down much at all. I'm pleased to have two of the gallery owners who have galleries in the Minnesota Street Project facility here with us today. And I'd first like to introduce Nancy Toomey of Nancy Toomey Fine Art. Nancy has opened her gallery at the Minnesota Street Project following an 18-year stint with a former gallery, the Toomey Terrell Gallery, in downtown San Francisco at a, another popular gallery building called 49 Gary. But it's the, the changes that have occurred since uh, her move that I wanted to focus on today. And so, Nancy, thank you for being here and and welcome to the program. It's good to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd love to get started by having you tell us a a little bit about the differences between your former location and the one that you're in now at the Minnesota Street Project. Uh, What is specifically, maybe most dramatically different for you in this new location? 
Um, I would have to say off the top of my head, I mean, I mean, I was downtown at a time when it was a very uh, sort of thriving art center. And due to um, rising rents and everything that has been very well documented in San Francisco for the last uh, 10 years or so, I noticed that, um, you know, it, it became more and more of a struggle. And, and, and I think that the, a lot of us in the visual arts felt that we had been um, – sort of marginalized and, you know, the, the, the landlords and everybody else were more interested in having, you know, tech firms and such take over their spaces. So what I noticed, the, the most exciting thing for me was rather than having a landlord like, you know, Cushman Wakefield uh, dictate what was going on in, in, um, in the building is it's a true arts community here. Um, you know, uh, Andy and Deborah have provided uh, a, a really a, just a beautifully orchestrated, well thought out um, um, uh, space, and and um, uh, just a space for all of us to uh, to thrive, and we work together. That's that's the main thing that I I really feel. I feel like the other gallerists that are here with me, we're we're all in it together. We all have each other's best interests at heart, um, as opposed to. Um, you know, any kind of, of um, you know, uh, threats. People get, you know, threatened or overly ambitious or there's none of that here. It just, it's, it just has a beautiful um, vibe, if I may use the word, that, um, you know, it's very conducive to um, artistic endeavor. That's so nice to hear because you are actually all galleries and in a sense you could be competitors and yet mm-hmm. you're uh, you're obviously feeling the confidence and the trust enough to to work together for the greater good and the greater good is it's to a, bring it's a lovely change yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah i bet i bet and i think it's just a great model for the way that uh, we can live in this world uh, we have those choices so nancy uh, tell me what kinds of uh, Clients have been attracted to come to this kind of de- building. It's it's more of a destination because it's not in the downtown area. Uh, but how do you? What kinds of uh, clients are you finding end up uh, there to look at art and and, and enjoy all the, the various art offerings that are there? Well, I th- you know I think there are always the usual suspects, the people that have always been engaged with the arts in the San Francisco Bay Area. And they certainly come around and, you know, usually every month to see what everybody's up to. Um, I, I feel like uh, it's a less intimidating building than, say, walking into 49 Geary, where it used to be. So uh, there is a younger contingent. I mean, obviously, one of the things that the, the art world in San Francisco has always been concerned with um, in later years is, is, is harnessing the, the tech money that has, you know, changed the fabric of the city and get these younger people in, interested in collecting art. So that's still an ongoing process. But, you know, you do really see a lot of, of younger people come through, whether it's they're here for an event and they wander around and then they become engaged. So that is quite heartening. Um, there's also uh, out-of-town people who come because this is now a, a destination on the um, art radar of, uh, of the San Francisco community. Um, and I've also noticed um, a lot of people from, like, the peninsula who mm-hmm. maybe would not have come to the 49 Geary Building are, are, are very excited about these spaces and are, are, are coming by. That's great. I think in terms of location, it's probably a very good proximity to the peninsula and, and Silicon Valley. Um, Nancy, mm-hmm. I'm curious to, to know that uh, how your gallery has changed a little bit. It seems that you have uh, moved more into a, a slightly different aesthetic by showing more of the School of Light and Space art. Uh, would you say that your gallery is sh- is shifting a bit and it's uh, it, what it shows? Uh, yeah, and, I've always yeah. yes, I, I've always been interested in in that sort of period uh, in Los Angeles that that gave birth to the light and space movement, and I think that there are a lot of you know even newer, younger artists who are 
still working within, um, you know, that, that aesthetic. I, I find it to be more and more compelling. Maybe it's because of the, as the, uh, the world gets more and more complicated and a little crazy. There's something to be said about taking the time to sort of take a deep Zen breath and, and experience to stand in front of a painting and experience light and our perceptions of light and, um, uh, you know, just really to take a moment and 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 of uh, reflection, if you will. And so I find that that that, that kind of it work really has become is a, more and more compelling. It is a definitely a very compelling aesthetic, and I want to hear more about it. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back after uh, a break. Because we're hearing from Nancy Toomey of Nancy Toomey Fine Art, and she's got a great story to tell. So stay with us. This is the Art Ambassador radio program. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, coming to you live on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran-owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various businesses interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show, coming to you live on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, and we're here today with Nancy Toomey of Nancy Toomey Fine Art, located in the brand new Minnesota Street Project in San Francisco. And Nancy was telling us about a ga- her gallery. One of the aesthetic focuses she has is showing art and uh, primarily paintings from what's called the Light and Space School or movement. And and Nancy, tell us about what it's like for people to experience some of these paintings in person. Well, I mean, it's it's exciting. And I think that Minnesota Street uh, provides enough of a a pleasant and welcoming um, environment. And and that's why it's it's, uh, such a pleasure to be here because – the kind of work that we're talking about is very, very process-driven and um, involves um, manipulation of material to, to, to create the experience of, of really contained light is, is what it is. And it, and, and it can't be experienced on a computer. It can't be experienced through a picture of, of, of the work. And I, I think that um, I think it's a very uh, revelatory experience for especially young collectors to come in and see this kind of work and, and, and realize that it's, it's, it's what they bring to the table. It's, it's them standing in front of this piece and, and, and uh, experiencing it firsthand. And it's, uh, it's, it's a very exciting thing to do. And 
Um, that's why we, we welcome, you know, people to come and actually experience the art firsthand. It's, it's really crucial. Yes, it's really true that there's nothing like being in the presence of fine art. And I think a lot of people who haven't been exposed to it, perhaps uh, when they were growing up, and maybe the only exposure they've had is to see art reproduced in a book or on a screen, uh, don't, don't really recognize the power and the value of being face-to-face with a work of art and allowing that one-on-one contact to seep into you, you know, allow, allowing yourself to develop mm-hmm. a relationship with the artwork. Uh, and, and you really find, you really offer that in your gallery, that opportunity for people, uh, you know, free of charge, obviously, to come in and uh, develop that relationship with a work of art and, and learn about that. Do you find that you're, uh, as a gallery owner, uh, often educating people about the pleasures and the joys of working and living with art? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I mean, I've had, I've had some really um, very, very interesting clients that I've met just this year. And, um, you know, there, these are people who are very advanced in terms of, you know, um, their place in the world, you know, uh, owning these fabulous houses and, and, and all that, but, but really feel unsure of themselves when it comes to, to placing artwork. And it's a very, you know, it is a daunting world, you know, and it's, it's frightening to a lot of people. So it's been really fun for me to have, you know, but maybe a young couple come in and, and, you know, they invite me to their house and I look around and I get a sense of who do I think these people are, what kind of art do I think that they really want to live with. And then, um, you know, I make proposals and I, I bring things to their house and we talk about them and they, they get to experience them firsthand and they they find them, you know, find themselves spending, first of all, more money on, on art than they thought that they would because I think they... they are starting to understand the intrinsic value of um, how it, it so enhances one's life to be surrounded by art. I mean, once really, when, once you yeah. start, you can't stop. <laughs> it's true. Once you start understanding and developing that relationship with with fine art, uh, you you want to have more and more of it, and and the more cursory experiences uh, just don't give you the same meat and richness and and value. Um, uh, you and I probably are are both examples of how that passion can lead us to a life where we just want to be around art and and share the the wonders and beauty and experience of it. Um, I know one of your interests, Nancy, is to yeah. Yeah. I know that one of your interests is also to uh, exhibit art that maybe has a more socially engaging message. Um, can you tell us about some of the artists that you work with or, or that aspect of what you bring to your gallery? There's one artist that comes to mind in particular that I carry. I mean, a lot of what I do is abstract, but there's one artist named Monica Lundy that I've been working with. Um, and I, I literally started working with her not because she particularly fit into my program, but because, you know, she is such an incredible artist. And my first show that I did with her was um, she had gone and researched um, people who had been arrested for prostitution in San Francisco in the 30s and 40s. And, and really, they were literally from the mug shots that she discovered um, in, in these um, through these archival books. And it was mesmerizing to see because it really it was a chronicle and, and a, a document of the dispossessed, the lost, the um, you know the souls, the sad souls that slipped through life, and she brought them to life on the gallery wall. And um, it was a sellout show. I mean, it was the most incredible show, and her career has has, has gone on to new heights. But it was thrilling. It was, you know, it was absolutely thrilling. So that was just one aspect of, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, this criminal underclass in a completely new way through these um, absolutely stunning portraits. Well, I remember walking into me- the show of Monica Lundy's work and, and being mes- mesmerized by it. And I am so glad that it got that kind of uh, 
sellout response. Uh, and did. that you yeah. all, yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, Nancy, it's really been great to have you on the show today and tell us about your experience. I want to invite you all to who are listening to visit Nancy Toomey Fine Art and see her ongoing exhibitions. They change approximately monthly. Uh, the her gallery is in the wonderful new Minnesota Street Project in the dog patch area of San Francisco. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, Nancy. And uh, Thank we're going to take a short thanks, break. It was a, it, it was a pleasure to speak with you. Cheers. Fantastic. Great to have you here. Uh, we're going to take a short break. This is the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I'm your host, Gwen Joyce, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Stay tuned. We have more interviews and more art. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact a symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Hello and welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce, coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Today we've been talking about the changing art scene in San Francisco and the impact of a wonderful new gallery-oriented and art-oriented facility in San Francisco called the Minnesota Street Project. We've been speaking with one of the owners of a gallery that's located at that space, Nancy Toomey. And now I'd like to introduce a second gallery owner, Monique Deshane. Monique is a gallery owner with a unique vision that combines both photography and painting. It's an unusual combination for a gallery. For eight years, Monique worked as the director of the Haynes Gallery, a prominent San Francisco gallery that shows a range of contemporary artists, uh, uh, both emerging and established. And many of those artists are Asian, uh, are of Asian heritage, such as artist Ai Weiwei. Monique left that gallery in 2015 with her love of art intact, but her plans for the future were up in the air. During the interim, she did a little curating, a little teaching, and worked on various projects. She was also invited to be on the board of the San Francisco Camera Works, a photography art center and museum, which gave her an opportunity to be involved with her ongoing love of photography. It was the artist that she knew who encouraged her to start her own gallery, and in 2016, she started Equinom. It took me a while, Monique, to 
figure out what uh, Equinom is, and I actually figured it out. It's your name, Monique. Uh, (laughs) Yes, it is. It's my name backwards. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, it was a college nickname that I had. Well, it's it's serving you well as a gal- gallery, and <laughs> welcome to the, welcome to the Art Ambassador Radio Show. Um, I'd love to have you tell us a little bit about your gallery and the stable of mm-hmm. photographers and painters that you are showing there. Yes, um, I am. I'm actually really interested in uh, photography and photographers that are sort of pushing the medium into, um, I think, a a new a new type of medium. Meaning, they're taking the historical aspects of photography and they're using those same types of chemical processes and shifting them and making these really um, amazing artworks and. Um, seeing where they can go with them. Um, And it's been really, really great. And I'm also interested in very, you know, in a way, straight photography. Um, But, you know, it's really in my heart. It's, um, you know, it's the use of like cyanotypes, photograms, um, you know, uh, uh, palladium prints and, you know, things like that. And, you know, I still believe in, you know, shooting with a film camera, and um, I think that it's a uh, really, um, uh, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful medium. Um, it is a fantastic medium. Of, yeah. Painting, uh, yeah. Photography yeah. And is, painting, is definitely a medium that has really, uh, artists have really been... For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapula strives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. Monique, it's so good to hear you talk about the artists in your gallery who are pushing different strains of photography and being experimental with their technique. You have you are currently mm. in the process of installing a, a wonderful new photography exhibit of an artist, Clea McKenna, in your space at the Minnesota yeah. Street. So tell us about that show. It sounds really exciting. It is. It's um Clea McKenna is um uh, we are installing, actually, we're finishing up installing today. Um, she has been working on a series of photograms um, that are photographic rubbings and photo etchings, as well as photograms. And they have this beauty to them. She has been um, doing uh, cuts of wood and with the grain of the wood. She's also been um, taking fabrics and doing um, etchings from the fabrics. And it's this really 
um, unique um, process in with, I should say, black and white, um, you know, um, photographic paper. Um, and now, it's really, really stunning. Now, I know there's a, also an installation that she's creating, which is, it sounds like it's going to be very entertaining, maybe even interactive for someone who comes into the gallery. And uh, that's quite different. What's that going to be like? Yeah. That is um, 50 uh, photographs that are roughly each photograph is about 20 by 24. And it's an installation of um, a, a two different continuous lines. And the lines have been created um, from rubbings that Clea has done from bunkers out in the headlands. Um, so from like a crack on the floor to a crack on the wall. And it's really, um, then what Clea does is that she takes these rubbings and after mm-hmm. going into the dark room and printing them, uh, or processing them, I should say, um, she goes back into her studio and she creates these different um, lines. And it's really, it's quite exquisite. Um, and along with that, Clea um, stepped into the film world and we are going to be um, uh, showing for the first time her uh, first film in the media room at the Minnesota Street Project. Um, and so that's actually quite exciting as well. What a nice and diverse uh, exhibition that will be. And speaking of diversity, Monique, last month when I was in your gallery, I saw an exhibition of of painters, of of artists who work in the painting medium. And that was quite exciting to see and different for you. So uh, how do you end up working with these painters and how do you select your artists? uh, From actually many different ways. Um, yeah, the last show, all uh, there was a painter in it, a sculptor, and a photographer. There's three artists in it, and each, but each one used photo, the photo medium in a different way. Um, and each one of them, I had been talking with, you know, and who was a friend of mine for several years. Um, that one of the artists and sculptors, she actually um, was introduced to me from another curator. Um, and uh, Dan Harrell, who's a, you know, painter, um, my, uh, um, my associate um, knew her work. And so we, you know, started talking to her, um, her that way. But my rest of my artists, I have, some of them I have had um, long relationships with in terms of like being friends with them or knowing their work and seeing them. I do believe that, you know, Every, you know, artist, even if I fall in love with their work, it's a long conversation in terms of like, you know, do I want to show them or, you know, work with them? And um, it's, you know, it's a long conversation that we have as, you know, art galleries, because there's a lot involved with, you know, with showcasing artists. Yes, and it sounds like it's a very personal relationship for you, which which makes sense to yeah. me. And, and you also have an unusual gallery in that you don't actually have a permanent space, and you've had to use a couple right. of different spaces or find spaces yeah. that are avail- available and have pop-up shows, yeah. and, which must really be challenging yeah. for you to connect to the space and the artists and to get your audience together. Uh, but you're doing really well. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm pleased <laughs> to hear it, but, but, but maybe you can talk yeah. a little bit about those challenges. Yeah, it has been, it has been challenging. I've basically been moving the gallery space around and using in the term pop-up um, probably every month to every two months. Um, and I've been doing this since April. Um, you know, uh, it has to do with, you know, the space that I had for a year uh, was changing and, you know, the rent was also going up. And um, so I needed to sort of, you know, figure out where my next you know, step was going to be. And my main concern was to keep the exhibition schedule going. Um, and Minnesota Street Project has allowed me to do that. I mean, what Andy and Deborah have 
set up with this, you know, program being at the galleries, the artist studios, the, you know, the offices, I mean, the art program, um, it's really um, quite amazing and has allowed me to um, still be successful to, I have my office in, you know, their, um, you know, short-term office areas. They also provide viewing rooms um, so that I can still see clients when I don't have gallery shows. Um, and that's actually been really, really amazing. The hard, you know, <laughs> aspects of it is, is that I'm moving every couple of months or every month. And that can be like really exhausting um, and a lot of work. But, um, but, you know, yes, I'm I've sure, got, I'm you know, sure it is. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've, what a, I've one of the things I, me, but. Well, that's good. That's good. And I, I hope that you have clients or potential clients who are following you as well and able to find you. I'm sure it's a challenge for your outreach and and maybe you have to be more present on Facebook and Instagram and <laughs> yes. getting the word out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the things so, I, I, I loved also uh, when I was in your gallery was seeing a video and you said that the Minnesota Street Project has a special video room. Um, and I hadn't really thought that in terms of accommodating that medium, you do need a different kind of hookup or f- facility. Uh, so, yeah. so how has that yeah. worked out? I, I, it's worked out beautifully. I mean, I think that uh, for me, seeing video as an art form, it needs to be felt and seen. It needs to be a physical, you know, um, experience, meaning you need to be surrounded by sound. You know, you need to have your visual, like, overcome, like you are in a movie theater, but in a slightly different way. And the media room that um, the Rappaport's built in the Minnesota Street Project is really, it's, it's exquisite, and the sound is just, you know, so pure and, you know, you can hear things and in different areas and, you know, of the, of the room. And, you know, it's allowed, um, you know, my artists to really, you know, uh, you know, show these, you know, pieces from Christina Seely, who showed a two channel piece that, you know, one side was, you know, this video from Greenland and the other side from Panama. But if you were in different, you know, sections of the room, you would hear different things from, a, you know, rushing of glacier melt to, you know, sort of birds or trees rustling. And, you know, there's something really, you know, it was just sort of amazing. Um, and it's, it's sort of the way that I feel that, you know, if you're doing video art that you should show it. Um, I know the Catherine Clark Gallery, they built in their gallery space a media room because she has so many artists who have been showing video art. Um, and they designated that area because you do need to have that specific sound quality. And there's no way that you can show it. Um, yeah, yes, it really it really is an immersive experience, and uh, it's yeah. different from look, looking again looking at a screen. But when you are Absolutely. allowed to be in a space, a space with total sound moving around and two different images that are really opposite, that you you have to physically turn around to see the other image. Yeah, uh, it, yeah it's 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 very powerful. Uh, I, you know, if mm-hmm. I if I could s- uh, summarize, Monique, I think that the art uh, powerful is a good word for you. I felt that, uh, mm-hmm. and each of each of the artists whose work I've seen has kind of an inherent inherent uh, projection of a, a certain powerful presence. Mm-hmm. Uh, Really, yeah. really wonderful, wonderful. I'm, um, I'm so glad that you've been able to, thank you, to pull this gallery together. And I know you're going to well, you. have some exciting things for us in the future, even with uh, the fact that you don't have a permanent space. Do you have some ideas yeah. about what's, what's going to, where it's going to take you, and how you can take the next steps forward so we can stay on path with you? Yeah, I will be. Um my next show, so Clea is through the end of the year um, and opens this Saturday. Um, and uh, I hope people come out. And also I should mention that uh, the first Saturday of every month in the dog patch is first Saturday and all of the galleries are open late. 
um, till uh, about 8 p.m. or a little bit later. Um, so it's a wonderful time to come, and there's always a you know great community that comes forward. But for my gallery personally, I will be showing Megan Rippenhoff in February and March. And um, I will also be doing the Photo Fair San Francisco, which is in February, uh, February 22nd to the 25th. And that's over at Fort Mason. Um, so, uh, and that uh, will be yeah. um, all galleries from, you know, local to national to international. And it's really, really exciting. So. Well, the fo photo fairs have been a good way for you to expand your reach, even without having a, a permanent space. So you've also been you've been to the the photo London, which gave you an international yes. presence. Yes. Yes. So yes, it's what, exciting. Yeah. Well, it is truly an international world, and Monique, I think you're making a specifically unique contribution by having a gallery that shows specifically photography and also includes painters whose works that you love. Uh, we look forward to continuing to see your gallery shows and having an opportunity to visit uh, Minnesota Street Project is certainly a unique place. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. We're going to take a short break. Thank you. This, this is Gwenda Joyce. I am your host of the Art Ambassador Radio Show on BBM Global Network and Tune in radio. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The earliest human societies worshipped a female goddess. Little is known about this time because we did not always have a written recorded history. It was around 3100 BC when the Sumerians invented the first written language, and everything that preceded this time is prehistory. The prehistorical record includes all of women's unwritten history from 30,000 B.C. to the time that men began achieving political power around 3,000 B.C. Male feminist artist Kimberly Berg maintains a strong position in educating and inspiring both men and women through his devotional art to the goddess in all women. Studying their history is paramount to understanding who women were and who they would become later living in a patriarchal society. To learn more about this important time in our history, go to www.isisrising.net. Do you ever wonder why certain things are happening in your life? How to start a business or a new direction? Need answers? Astrologer Bonnie Perbula can help you reveal your true self and gain strength and focus so you can achieve greater joy and success. Working with a natal birth date, time, and location, Bonnie brings out qualities to aid you in getting the best from your life. She can help you unlock dormant traits to bring you greater awareness. Bonnie also conducts public speaking engagements to educate aspiring astrologers on their journey to the stars. A gifted artist, Bonnie bridges her talents and recently launched a line of Astro Bears, uniquely created in colors of individuals' astrology charts. She also makes one-of-a-kind necklaces of crystal beads and woven thread. To learn more about the world of Bonnie Prabula, go to BonnieGPrabula.com. And for astrology consulting, visit AstrologyConsultants.com or call or email her at 808-526-1536 or BonnieGP at AOL.com. Welcome back to the Art Ambassador Radio Show on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Gwenda Joyce. We've been talking with two gallery owners today from San Francisco. Galleries are intended to be welcoming and friendly places, places to introduce people to art and inspire interest. There's no need to be intimidated, as you can see by our conversations today with the gallery owners and built into the uh, looking at art and making it accessible to the general public. Looking at art galleries is free. It's one of the most entertaining cultural activities that people can do free of charge. Never been to a gallery? Don't know what to do? Well, all you have to do is walk in and look around. Engage with the art, look at it up close, and look at it at a distance. See if you can figure out what the artist is thinking as he or she is making the art. Art is both a form of expression and a communication. If it confuses you, don't be afraid to ask questions. People in the gallery are trained staff and they're there to inform you about the art and the artist. They're not going to expect that you have all the answers. Feeling pressured to buy? Also, no need to. Sure, it's great if you want to buy art, 
But most gallery staff realizes that it's rare for someone to just walk in and buy something off the wall. Usually you want to develop a relationship or have an experience, and it takes time to develop that. You might want to learn more about the artist. You might want to know what the materials are. And you also want to fall in love with it. You don't want to buy something that someone else tells you to buy just for the sake of, of their, their taste. It's a very personal thing, probably the most personal thing that there is. Prices are often not made public, and this is intentional. People are, are often asking, you know, where's, why aren't there prices on the wall? And the reason that's done is so that the artwork is considered first and foremost, you know, separate from how much it costs. Artwork has intrinsic value, and if you can get that and see that and relate to that, then that's what's really most important. The pricing is secondary. Uh, galleries don't want to come across as having a price tag be more important than the art. So they don't necessarily push it forward. But if you are interested in purchasing or even curious about the price of the art, it's fine to ask. That's totally valid. Asking doesn't mean you're obligated to buy as well. The same goes with asking for more information about the art and the artist. Feel free to do so. I think you can tell from our gallery owners who are, were on the show today that they want to answer your questions. They want to help you with their guidance. Next week is Art Fair Week in Miami. All of us art lovers, including myself, will be heading there to see the most diverse presentation of thousands of artists and hundreds of galleries and more than 15 art fairs. It's a busy time and very excited. I hope you'll join me when I come back and I'll bring a full report back to you. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at gwenda at artambassador.net. I'll answer them on our next, next program. This is Gwenda Joyce, the Art Ambassador, your host of the Art Ambassador radio program. Thanks for joining us today on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. See you next time. This has been the Art Ambassador with your host, Gwenda Joyce. If you're stuck in a creative world with little to no meaningful exposure and are looking to blend creative with the entrepreneurial spirit, listen each week for enlightening options and answers on Gwenda Joyce's The Art Ambassador. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.